evening. On behalf of the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service, we welcome you to the UW Center for Civic Engagement at UW Marathon County for tonight's forum, Ready or Not, What the Federal Health Insurance Marketplace Means for Wisconsin. My name is Eric Giordano. I am the director of the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service, and we would like to thank Dean Keith Montgomery and the UW Marathon County campus for the use of this beautiful facility. We're also grateful to our generous sponsors who you have seen on the slideshow and some of the signs around outside the theater. And I'd especially like to mention the big three healthcare systems in central Wisconsin, Aspirus, Marshfield Clinic, and Ministry Healthcare, who agreed early on to collaborate on sponsoring this event, each recognizing the importance of this issue for our state and region. And then we were also privileged to have many other wonderful sponsors, and I'd like to thank each of them for their contributions. I'd also like to thank the Medical College of Wisconsin, with whom we are partnering to offer continuing medical education credits. Um, and while I take care of uh, the business uh, at hand here, some slides will be coming through that will basically be part of a CME accreditation agreement. In other words, conflict of interest slides, the fine print that we have to show. So in case you're wondering why those slides are up, that is the reason. Tonight's forum would not be possible without the hard work of our conference planning committee. And as you know, tonight is a public forum, but this is part of a broader conference, which will continue tomorrow morning uh, as a paid uh, event, mostly for professionals. And I'd like at this moment if the committee members who participated in planning this entire conference would stand so we can recognize you. Don't be shy. As a reminder for those attending the professional conference tomorrow morning, registration opens at the Westwood Conference Center from 8 a.m. until 8.45 a.m. Tonight's panel presentation will be followed by an audience question and answer session. WIP staff will circulate through the theater with microphones and you may direct your questions to one or all of the panelists. Please limit yourself to one question per person, please. Above all, we ask that you accord our speakers and each other the courtesy and respect that we all expect from a public forum dedicated to civil dialogue. At this time, please check to make sure that cell phones and pagers, other electronic devices are silenced. And I want to remind you that our forum will end promptly at 9 p.m. Now it is my pleasure to introduce two people who have had a significant role in this conference. First, I would like to introduce our event organizer, Dr. Karina Norbaum. You need to know three things about Dr. Norbaum. First, she is a practicing physician at the Aspirus Walk-In Clinic and has spent many years as a family physician in Anago. Second, she is currently serving as our first ever WIPS Community Fellow. And third, the reason she is a WIPS Community Fellow is because she came to us with an idea and an unstoppable drive to help educate the citizens of Wisconsin, including her own patients and colleagues, about the importance and impact of the Affordable Care Act. I don't want to steal her thunder, um, but since our conversations beginning late last year, she has crisscrossed the state, finding sponsors, lining up an incredible slate of speakers, both for tonight's public event and tomorrow's professional-oriented conference. So please join me in thanking Dr. Karina Norbaum for her role in putting this event together. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Wisconsin's longest serving congressman from right here in the 7th Congressional, Wisconsin 7th Congressional District, Congressman Dave Obey. Uh, currently serves, many of you might not know this, as a senior fellow at the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service, and we are grateful for his many contributions to our work, including harmonica playing, which some of you may have heard about. Congressman Obi has spent a lifetime of service working to improve the quality of life for all citizens, and especially those who are not born into economic wealth. I think it is highly appropriate that the man who presided over the House when the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act passed can be here to officially welcome us into this event. Following Congressman Obi, we will then hear from Dr. Karina Norbaum. 
Please join me at this time in welcoming Congressman Dave Obey. Well, good afternoon or good evening or whatever it is. I, uh, I'd like to ask the same question that uh, a vice presidential candidate once asked in the presidential debates. Why are we here? If you'll remember that. Uh, in one sense, I think we're all here because uh, uh, I was in the chair when this bill passed. And so in a sense, any of the arguments and any of the disagreements and any of the controversy that uh, is voiced tonight and tomorrow can be blamed on me because more than anybody else in this room, I, uh, I, I caused the problem and they're going to have to describe how we get out of it. Um, but the fundamental reason we're here is to try to uh, reach a better understanding about exactly how this new health care bill is going to work. As you know, since its passage, uh, there's been no scarcity of comments about the shortcomings of the new law. Some of that criticism is valid. Some is a misinformation, uh, honestly arrived at and some is outright off base. Now the bill is complicated, and that's simply because the system that it's meant to change is also extremely com com complicated. Uh, the reason it was passed was because the country lost its patience with uh, the multitude of problems which people confront in the healthcare system every day not just consumers being frustrated, but also many providers. Um, I can easily produce my own list of shortcomings of the, uh, 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 in, in the bill. Uh, some of the uh, uh, limits that are drawn in terms of eligibility or in the size of subsidies uh, are, are drawn in questionable places or set at questionable levels and we're going to have a national conversation about that. Uh, and there are many other decisions that people can question. We can debate the definition of small business. We can uh, debate the adequacy of subsidies uh, that will be provided to many people under the bill. Um, some people will want to continue to, to argue about the fact that there was no public option or that there was a, not a single payer approach to the uh, to the legislation. Uh, I myself might have preferred that, but I have one problem. I can count. And so I concluded about 30 years ago that, uh, that, that that was not likely to happen. And so we would wind up building on the existing health care system. The political right can confine uh, or they can continue to uh, bemoan the fact that we have a government run health plan in this operation, and the political left can bemoan uh, their, uh, their belief that we don't and that we shouldn't have relied on uh, the private insurance system at all. But those arguments, in my judgment, are past. And what counts now is simply how is it going to work and how can we all, regardless of political philosophies, make it work better. I just want to tell you one story. I don't know how many people in this room will, will, will remember a fellow by the name of Jerry Boylo. Jerry represented this district in Congress from 1930 to 1938. And in 1938, he got beat. Years later, my dad ran a supper club, the old Gaslight, down on, uh, on Harrison Boulevard, it was called in those days. And on one Saturday afternoon, Jerry Boylo came into the place, and I was there, and I bought him a martini. And then I bought him another martini, and I got him to talk. And I said, Jerry, what happened to you in 1938? Why did you get beat? He said, it's simple. He said, senior citizens voted against me because I voted for Social Security. I said, you've got to be kidding yourself. Nobody, no senior would vote against you for voting for Social Security. Oh, he said, in those days they would. He said, the problem was that in my district, uh, the Townsend plan was very, very popular. 
It was named after old Doc Townsend from California. And uh, old Doc Townsend simply wanted a monthly stipend paid to every senior citizen, whether they had paid into the system or not. And Boylow said FDR understood that that would never stand the test of time because you had to have a contributory program. You could not just have the Townsend plan because it looked like a welfare plan and people don't like welfare. And Jerry said, so I stuck with Roosevelt and I campaigned all over the, all over the district for it. And uh, he said Townsend moved into uh, my district, set up a bunch of Townsend clubs and they beat me. Now, what's the moral of that story? Today, we can look back at Social Security and we can say, good gravy, what were all those arguments about? I cannot imagine this society without Social Security. And I would submit to you that the same thing will be true 30 years from now with respect to the health care legislation. Uh, we have changed Social Security many times since it was initially passed. We've changed Medicare a number of times since it initially passed. And we will change this legislation many times over the next 30 years. But what counts is how you make the system work. My favorite philosopher is a fellow by the name of Archie the Cockroach. Archie was a character who was invented by a writer by the name of Don Marcus back in the 20s. And, uh, he supposedly was a poet who had died and who uh, lived in, the, in a newspaperman's office. And at night he would climb out onto the typewriter and dive headfirst onto the keys and he'd leave these little messages which would appear in the paper the next day. One of the messages he left was this. Did you ever notice that when a politician does get an idea, he gets it all wrong? <laughs> the, 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 the second thing that he said, which I like, is uh, what counts is not what kind of system mankind happens to have. What counts is what mankind does with whatever system he happens to have. And I think that certainly rings true with respect to this uh, le legislation. Uh, it is going to be a very difficult job explaining to people what their rights are and what their obligations are under the legislation. But uh, that's the job of public servants and it's also going to be the job of a lot of providers in the field. And I want to express my uh, appreciation to all of those who uh, participated in making this forum a reality to, uh, tonight. Especially I want to thank the, 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 the panelists for both what they will say um, tonight and what they will say and do tomorrow. And I want to thank you all for coming to learn as much as you can. Thanks again. Good evening. What exactly is a health insurance exchange? It's a question that I asked myself while I was at a medical conference, and a few days later, after learning about Governor Walker's decision to default to the Federal Health Insurance Exchange back in November, I was feeling a little bit uneducated, so I wanted to learn more. And in doing so, I learned that there were many others who were also unaware, and even if they were aware of the concept um, of the exchange and, and if it was understood, there were even more questions as to how this was gonna work. So as I continued to research the topic, it became apparent that there seemed to be uncertainty across all sectors. Several days ago, a reporter sincerely asked me, why should people care? The Affordable Care Act is probably the most significant piece of health care legislation since Medicaid and Medicare nearly 50 years ago. And at the heart of the ACA is the concept of the health insurance exchange and the individual mandate uh, for health insurance and the attempt to make health insurance coverage accessible to 30 million Americans who currently are uninsured. As a physician, I have witnessed how the lack of health insurance can negatively affect a patient's health. On October 1st, uh, just three and a half months from now, consumers throughout the country will be able to start enrolling in a health insurance marketplace. 
whether as part of a state-run marketplace or in the case of Wisconsin and 34 other states, a federally facilitated marketplace. The Federal Health Insurance Exchange, or federally facilitated marketplace as it is now called, is a topic of critical importance. Our objective tonight is to provide education and background about the federally facilitated marketplace and what it means to Wisconsin. We are hoping to stimulate meaningful discussion about the following. How will implementation of the federally facilitated marketplace and related changes in Medicaid and the individual mandate requirement impact accessibility, affordability, and quality of healthcare in Wisconsin? How will the marketplace and the mandate for insurance affect the work of medical providers, health systems, the insurance industry, small businesses, large employers, local and state government? Who should enroll and how will people navigate within the marketplace? So to delve into that, um, it is my privilege to introduce our moderator for this evening, Tim Bartholo. Dr. Bartholo is the Chief Medical Officer of the Wisconsin Medical Society. And in this position, he's responsible for getting physicians, employers, payers, legislators, and other critical healthcare stakeholders engaged and talking together regarding issues relevant to healthcare delivery reform on state and federal levels. He understands physician-patient relationships and patient care. He is a true family doc. Uh, having practiced family medicine for 16 years. As an owner of the practice, Tim also experienced managing a small business. And further, he served as the medical director for an insurer and for a large community physicians network. Tim has been a wonderful resource. He's a wealth of knowledge, and as a fellow family physician, I applaud his leadership in working to improve health and healthcare delivery in Wisconsin. So please welcome Tim Bartholo. Well, it's absolutely a delight to be with you, and what a terrific forum um, to the Institute. Um, thank you for the great work of helping to ask this question, uh, how will we achieve this, to Congressman Obie's um, question, you know, we, we uh, have before us the law of the land. And we have the great uh, opportunity to make this, this uh, law actually work for us in our communities. It isn't going to be somebody from someplace else that actually makes this work for us. It'll have to be us doing part of this lift. Somewhere for, somewhere, for, somewhere against uh, the bill as it came through Congress, but this is today uh, what it is that, that we have uh, in terms of the framework of how we will uh, take care of our communities and, and their health and so we're about the task of trying to think about how do we do that best. I have the great uh, pleasure of introducing three panelists tonight. You have in your packet, if you will, uh, their bios, and I'm not going to go through all of them so as we can preserve time for their comments and for your questions. I think, Corey, also I'd like to make mention of the, um, the Kaiser Family Fund piece that's also in your packet, as well as the, um, the uh, Consumers Union piece um, in the, um, I think, uh, second and third or third and fourth uh, pages of your uh, packet. Uh, I won't draw your attention to them more now, but they uh, may be quite interesting to you later. Bob Leshevsky is, uh, is a hometown guy and uh, is a graduate of this fine institution. Um, as, uh, as an alum of UW Marathon County, he's gone on to Washington to advise a, a whole number of uh, insurance uh, companies, uh, casualty, health care, HMOs, the blues, and so forth. You have this in your packet. Um, he also publishes the Health Policy and Marketplace Review. Those of you that are, uh, those of you that, are that keen on the detail may have read uh, some of uh, Bob's work. We're very grateful for him being here. He, uh, by the way, has survived the McLaughlin Group and then the one-on-one uh, the, uh, -on -one, uh, piece. Some of you may have seen this. Uh, from time to time on television. It's not an easy place to take questions. Mary Ellen Schill uh, is, is uh, with uh, Reuter and Ware. She is uh, consulting with a variety of businesses on both uh, public and uh, private sector employer benefits. 
she, um, she's been a great value to many, I'm sure, who are wondering what does this law mean to me and how do I interpret what it is that my responsibilities and obligations are. She, um, she's a uh, St. Norbert College uh, graduate and uh, took her JD from Notre Dame. David Weimer, well known to uh, the Wisconsin landscape, will uh, wrap up our comments tonight before your questions. And if you will, be very careful, not just for David, but for all of them, you know, have uh, some terrific uh, provocative questions to ask, please. David, um, David's been very active in uh, assisting our communities uh, in trying to make sure that all of our individuals have access to various uh, opportunities within our community. Um, he's a senior fellow at the Community Advocates uh, uh, Public Policy Institute located in Milwaukee. He has been part of uh, pieces of legislation that you all may know and certainly your citizens have benefited from, including the Wisconsin's Transitional Jobs Demonstration Project, the Supplemental Earned Income Tax Credit, W-2, Badger Care, and frankly, that's a short list. Um, and, and what's actually in your bio is a short list. Um, he was uh, previously budget director for Governor Doyle, chief of staff for uh, Mayor Norquist, staff for Senator Edward Kennedy, a great friend to health care, yes, and um, ultimately um, uh, undergraduate and law school degrees from Harvard. With that, I'd like to open comments from our three panelists. And Bob, if you would uh, first take the stage. Good evening. It's good to be here tonight, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's always interesting coming back and seeing how things change. This place was a lot smaller the last time I spent any time here. Um, just to, for full disclosure, I did not support passage of the Affordable Care Act. I believe that what the country needed was health care reform. Our health care costs are unsustainable, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, the, uh, the Affordable Care Act, the employer-based insurance we have a problem with cost and sustainability. I sort of likened the way we did things by, by uh, sort of like our healthcare system's the Titanic. It's sinking because of its costs. So we added 30 million more people onto it and it sinks further. But at the same time, it is absolutely critical that we did uh, reform the insurance system, whether it was getting rid of pre-existing conditions in medical underwriting or providing subsidies for people. I just felt that if you're gonna expand the entitlement you ought to do it in a way that you also make the system sustainable. Now, Senator Kennedy was fond of saying over the years, politics is the art of the possible. The Affordable Care Act is what was possible. So in that sense, it's progress. Now, what I do for a living is I advise people in the business of health care, whether they run an HMO or an insurance company, or whether they run a drug company or a hospital system. Uh, Sunday morning, I, I gave the keynote address at a large physician conference in Washington, D.C. So my job as a business person, dealing with other business people in the healthcare arena, is to be pragmatic. This is the law of the land, we've now got to implement it. Now, a number of you probably really don't like Obamacare, and you're gonna, you're gonna vote Republican to try to get this thing overturned. What I just remind everybody is Barack Obama's gonna be in the White House until January of 2017. If the Republicans sweep the elections in 2016, the presidency, the House, and the Senate, and they come in in 2017, repeal Obamacare, put in their own prescription for Medicare and Medicaid reform, it's gonna take them two or three years to implement it. When the Republicans passed the Part D drug benefit in 2003, they didn't launch it until 2006. You don't just, you don't just turn the switch on. The Obama administration's been working on implementation of this, this program since, since 2010, so it's gonna be almost four years. So the Affordable Care Act is with us until at least 2019 or 2020, whether you like it or not. And in, in the business of health care, whether, whether anybody likes it or not, it's our job now to make it work. Understand what it is and make it work. So hopefully tonight, if I can help you, it is from that perspective. If you've come here to understand what it is and how it's going to work, I can help you. If you've come here to tell me what's wrong with it, I can sympathize with you. But it's, it's, it's the law of the land, and it's going to be the law of the land for the next six or seven years. This is going to be implemented, and we have to do the best job we can to make it work. Now, when it, when it, this, this law is going to be implemented uh, over a health care system that is going through dramatic changes as we speak. 
For years, our health care costs have been out of control, escalating way too fast. The average cost of family health insurance in the United States provided through an employer is $15,000 a year. $15,000 a year is what average employer provided health insurance costs. And we've already started to implement a lot of things in the market to make it work differently. One of the things that's likely to change in the coming years is we'll move away from the so-called fee-for-service system, where doctors and hospitals are paid more piecemeal than for an outcome. Without a question, we're going to have lots of change going on in the system coincident with the Affordable Care Act. If we're really lucky, the things that are going on in the marketplace and the things that we're experimenting with in public policy in terms of providers taking more risk and, and being more, more responsible for outcomes, if we're lucky, all of those things will come together and this will work out. But it's going to be a very difficult period of years as we go forward. Um, this, 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 this doesn't work very well in terms of me to, to follow my own slides. But the Affordable Care Act uh, was supposed to insure another 30 million people. About half, of them in about half of them in Medicaid and about half of them in the insurance exchanges. While we're here to talk primarily about the insurance exchanges, here in Wisconsin, the issue of Medicaid and the insurance exchanges is integrated like in no other state because your governor and your legislature has, have decided not to implement the Obama uh, Medicaid expansion and not to implement the exchanges, but rather let the federal government come in and do the exchanges and at the same time uh, tr put, m put many of the people who would have been under Medicaid in, under the Affordable Care Act into the exchanges. And so here, like no other state, we're, we're going to have a hybrid experiment. Uh, one that's very controversial, and one you'll hear more about as this conference goes on, I think. Uh, it'll be very important to, uh, uh, to uh, how Wisconsin actually experiences this. Now, in the exchanges, people who don't have health insurance, people under the age of 65 who are not eligible for Medicare and don't have health insurance through their employer will be able to go to the exchange and buy it, individual health insurance, if you will. One of the big debates about the Affordable Care Act is what the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, is going to do, do to the cost of uh, health insurance, particularly in the exchanges. This is a map, and you're not going to be able to read the tiny numbers, but what I wanted to point out is there are a great many estimates out there about how this is going to impact the cost. And it's going to impact the cost differently in different states. The dark red states are going to have, the, are, the Society of Actuaries has projected, will have the biggest cost hit because of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the uh, darkest states, the least so. And you'll notice Wisconsin is one of the states projected to have the biggest increases. And that's because the Affordable Care Act sets very high standards for what a package of insurance looks like. Some states have more regulation than others. A state like New York is a very highly regulated state. Uh, and, and as a result, the likelihood of, of its insurance rates increasing significantly is much lower than a state that has far less insurance regulation. In other words, if the stretch to get to Obamacare is a big one, you're going to get hit by greater rates. The projections here in Wisconsin are that this will be one of the states that gets hit hard. Here's another estimate of what those rates might look like. This is done by a centrist group, a group of a group run by conservative Democrats, if you will, pretty much the center of the political spectrum. They went out and hired one of the big actuarial firms to estimate what costs would go up in a number of states. Wisconsin was one of the states that they estimated. And as you can see under the Wisconsin line, uh, the cheapest plan, uh, the, bronze, the so-called bronze plan in the exchange, the increase won't be too great, but that's not a, that's not a benefit with a, that's not a, a package with a lot of benefits. But if you go to the silver plan, which is, the, which is the core plan in the exchanges, you might be paying 50% more for health insurance than you might have been otherwise. Now, to be fair, what you paid in 2013 for individual health insurance was what you paid for health insurance when you passed medical underwriting and pre-existing conditions. Those things are outlawed now. And you will have a rich, much richer benefit package. So to be fair, you will pay more but it'll be in a different kind of system for more benefits. But critics of the Affordable Care Act would say, well, that's fine, but gee, I wish I could keep my Chevrolet plan. And if you'd let me keep my Chevrolet plan, the rate increase wouldn't be as great. Because while the Affordable Care Act is a great deal to improve affordability and access to insurance, 
It also requires everybody to have, to have uh, I'm not, it's probably inappropriate to say a Cadillac plan, but you might have a Chevrolet and, and relatively this might look more like a Cadillac plan. And so lots of folks are saying, let me keep my Chevrolet. After all, what, didn't the president say, if you like your insurance, you can keep it? There will be a number of people who will get letters from their insurance company this fall saying they can't keep the insurance they've got now because it doesn't comply. And that will be an issue. And it will, and it will be unpopular. And it will undercut the popularity of the Affordable Care Act as a result. Now, the Affordable Care Act also, one of the, 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 where most of the money in the Affordable Care Act is spent is on subsidies for people. A big chunk of the money, the biggest chunk of the money is to subsidize access so people can buy insurance. Another fairly big chunk is the expansion of the Medicaid program. Uh, so there's lots of federal money here to expand Medicaid. Your state is not taking that Medicaid expansion. So even though your tax dollars go to pay for the Affordable Care Act, you won't benefit from that because your governor and your legislature are going to turn that expansion down. But you will have access to the insurance exchanges. And how much support you get in premium will be a function of what your income is. If your income is, uh, is 100 to 130 percent of the, of the poverty level, you'll only have to pay about 2 percent of your income for health insurance. 100 percent of the poverty level is around $12,500 for an individual, incidentally. If you're at 400 percent of poverty, you're going to have to pay up to 9.5 percent of your income. And I'll show you some examples in a minute. But how much federal assistance people get will be a function of how much money they make. This is clearly a means-tested benefit. And if we look at some of the, you can see some of the examples here. Um, subsidies are based on the uh, silver plan, which is essentially a $2,000 deductible plan for most people. It's a little less for low-income people. If, uh, if you're a single person making $11,490, you're only going to pay 2% of your income. A family of four at 100% of the poverty level, that's a family of four making $23,500, would pay more than, no more than $471 for health insurance. They would get a plan with about a $700 per person deductible and $2,000 in annual out-of-pocket maximum. Pretty good deal for low-income people. As we go up the, up the charts, though, it starts to get a little more expensive. A single person making 250% of the poverty level, or $28,000, $29,000, will pay $2,300 a year for their health insurance. Now remember, employer-provided health insurance for a family costs about $15,000 a year, so it's a pretty good deal. If you start going further up the, the scale, it becomes much more difficult. A family of four making 300% of poverty, that's $71,000 a year, would have to pay $6,700 toward their health insurance. Now, on one level, that's a heck of a deal, because that, that policy is probably worth $15,000. But on the other hand, think about a family of four making $70,000, going to the insurance exchange, and being told it's going to cost you almost $7,000, and you're going to get a policy with a $2,000 per person deductible. That's still going to be a stretch. Incidentally, Senator Kennedy, at the beginning of this whole process, introduced a bill that would have made these subsidies much more affordable for these kinds of families. It would have cost $2 trillion to pass that bill instead of the $1 trillion the Affordable Care Act passed, uh, cost. So again, it's the politics of reality. We weren't going to be able to pass a trillion dollar bill. Uh, and, uh, and so we've got a compromise here. And the compromise is going to hit middle income families the hardest. If you're making 400% of poverty, that's $94,200 a year. You're, in a family of four, you're going to have to pay all of the health insurance, maybe $15,000 a year. If you're making just less than that, you're going to have to pay about $9,000 a year uh, for, for family health insurance. And when it's done, you'll have a plan with a $2,000 deductible. So it's, it's still not going to make things as affordable as you might like. But, it, but this costs our country a trillion dollars to go this far. Now, one of the big questions people are asking are, with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, are people going to continue to offer employer-based insurance? Are employers going to continue to offer insurance? Employers with less than 50 employees uh, are not required to offer coverage. Employers with more than 50 employees are required to offer coverage. If they don't, they pay a $2,000 fine. 
Now remember I said employer-based insurance costs about $15,000 for a family and it costs about five, dollars $6,000 just for a single employee. So a $2,000 fine in some respects is somewhat of a bargain. So lots of people are worried that employers are gonna drop coverage. I think those, I think those concerns are overstated. We've, we've already started going through a process where employers have started to abandon health insurance, particularly for small employers with uh, low profit margins, low wage workers where they don't compete for labor. So in many businesses where you don't have to compete for labor, small employers have been walking away from health insurance for years now. Only about 50% of the employers offer health insurance. Larger employers, 99% plus, over 200 employees offer health insurance. And they might drop it. Uh, I doubt that will happen. Be you, could, you could give an employee the five or $6,000 the employer is contributing toward health insurance. That $5,000 would be taxable income to that worker. They'd have to then take it to the exchange. If you're a low income person, the after tax, two, $3,000, as you saw, is enough to buy a health insurance policy. But if you're a higher income person and you have to pay eight or $9,000 for health insurance, and your, and your employer gives you five, $6,000 that you have to pay taxes on, it's not gonna come close. I think where we have employers who have to compete for labor, uh, we're gonna continue to see a commitment to employee benefits. In the small employer market, where employers don't have to compete for labor, uh, where, they're, where they're dealing with lower income workers, not skilled, I think more often than not, they will not be providing insurance and, and those people will be going to the exchange. So on a net basis, the Affordable Care Act does a lot of good things. It finally reforms the insurance market. Give it, give it high marks for that. It finally provides assistance for people to purchase insurance. But as you can see, it's still gonna be a stretch for the middle class. And while there are some things in here to begin thinking about cost containment, there's very, very little. In fact, the Congressional Budget Office scored very little from a cost containment standpoint. And that's the soft underbelly of the Affordable Care Act. But it is the law of the land, and everybody that I know and work with out there is working very hard now to implement it. Bob, thank you so much. Mary Ellen? Alan will give us some thoughts about uh, how employers are uh, responding. And you all are writing down your questions carefully, right? And for very provocative questions. Thanks, everyone. I want to thank the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service for uh, hosting this uh, summit, uh, both tonight's forum and, and the events tomorrow. I think for those of us who are living this day in and day out, it's, it's very welcome to have something so close to home. Um, I'm honored to be a part of the panel this evening um, as uh, not quite a local girl from Wisconsin Rapids, but it, but it is nice to, to see uh, the cast of, of folks that we're going to have speaking both tonight and tomorrow and some of the heavy hitters in the industry. And, and for those of us who are kind of wonky about it, it's really kind of neat. Um, as, as my introduction said, I'm an employee benefits attorney here in Wausau at the law firm of Ruder Ware. And as a management side law firm, meaning we represent businesses and primarily uh, employers, not employees, as we do that representation, um, my line of work, I am working with employers, large and small, public and private, nonprofit and for-profit, and advising them with respect to some of the benefits that they provide to their workers. And obviously since March 23rd, 2010, one of uh, primary part of my day has been spent dealing with health care reform and the Reconciliation Act. Uh, two very significant pieces of legislation passed a week apart back in March of 2010. Um, I, like many of you, uh, watched the, the news, watched TV when the Supreme Court decision came down. Um, unlike many of you, I kind of figured out right away that I think it had been upheld because of the, the tax issues, um, but it was kind of interesting to, to see the general public and their interpretation of things. Um, and, you know, I, we've heard many times tonight it's the law of the land, and, and that, you know, that is the body that, that tells us that it is. And so um, it is something that my clients um, have now been forced to deal with, and we're dealing with it every day. Um, I've been fortunate to be involved with, with employer-provided health insurance all my life. Um, 
starting out as a dependent, my family always had good health coverage. My father worked in the paper mill in Wisconsin Rapids, and so we, we did not want for good health coverage, good dental coverage, good vision coverage. Um, upon graduation from law school, I got a, a, a good job with a rather uh, significantly sized law firm down in Milwaukee, Foley and Lardner. And uh, starting out September 1st, 1988, I had health insurance as, as an attorney there. Uh, I came up to Wausau in 1992 to work at Reuter Ware. I continued to enjoy very good health coverage. So I have been a, a beneficiary of employer-provided health coverage all my life. Now, uh, becoming a, a, many years ago, becoming a shareholder in Reuter Ware and now a member of its board of directors, I am also a business owner, and I am charged with trying to spend uh, my fellow shareholders' money wisely. Um, I feel I have a fiduciary obligation to treat our employees fairly. I, we want to be the employer of choice. And so when uh, Bob referenced the fact that there are some employers who are thinking about getting out of group health care and just paying the penalty, you know, we, are, we unlike it, uh, much like every other employer, that is something that you do have to consider. But as I said before, we see ourselves as an employer of choice here in Wausau. And uh, I would shudder to think about the disruption in the workplace to go from having a very good health, co very good health coverage provided by the employer to, uh, to something less than that. That being said, I do advise a lot of smaller employers who currently don't sponsor health coverage or, or do, and it's a very iffy year-by-year -year renewal kind of thing for whom what we are going to talk about this uh, tonight and tomorrow, the marketplace, is a great opportunity. And it's something that I think when we all uh, heard about health care reform and heard about the exchanges, we always thought it was something for individuals, and it's not. The exchanges are also there starting in 2014 for smaller employers, and within a few years, the idea is that employers of all sizes can send their employees to the exchanges. Um, in advising my employer cry, uh, clients, uh, it was like the many stages of grief although it seems as though denial and anger were the two prim primary ones. Um, I, um, I presented at a lot of seminars. Our firm does a lot of uh, work in this area, and we do go take our shows on the road. I also worked with a lot of the local chambers, human resource organizations, and for the first couple years, it was just denial. I had a lot of people showing up to my seminars. I had a lot of questions, but it seems like it was the same people that came coming back time after time and asking the same questions. And after a while, you get a little tired of that, but you, you, know, you want to be polite. Um, then the Supreme Court decision came down, and it was now the law of the land, and people started to take it a little bit more seriously, but they were still asking the same questions. And so uh, finally, within the last year or so, I finally said, because I got to know these people pretty well, and I said, you know, you keep coming to all my seminars, either you're not, I'm not doing a very good job explaining, or you're just not listening. And, and the answer really was they were still in that denial stage, and everyone expects some sort of secret sauce that they're going to be able to take back to their HR department or their controller or the owner of the business and say, here's the answer. Here's how we're going to comply with health care reform, and here's what the marketplace can do for us. And it's not that simple. It is a very complicated piece of legislation. It's tax. It's benefits. It's, it's labor relations. There's all sorts of things going on here. Um, but there is one thing that allows those of us as individuals and those of us as employers where, we can, where, where the idea is, is that we can have an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, and so we have one-stop shopping, and that is what is known as the marketplace that we'll hear about today. Um, one last comment on health care reform. I find it's, a, it's the great unifier. It, either you love it or you hate it, and uh, being a Notre Dame grad, it's kind of like Notre Dame football. Either you love them or you hate them. It's same thing, same thing with health care reform. As I said before, I think a lot of folks don't realize that the marketplace, the exchanges, um, of which Wisconsin's going with the federally facilitated exchange, it is also there for employers, for smaller employers starting in 2014. And it's the same marketplace. It's just that employers can take their employees to the market and offer to their employees an array of group health coverage within certain metal levels, and not even necessarily uh, provide a contribution towards that coverage. So the marketplace is for individuals, and, is, and is, it is also for small employers. The idea of the marketplace um, and, and the applications, a draft of the application has already been, been published, 
is, is it's one uniform application. I mean, now if somebody wants to go out and procure health coverage, whether it's through their employer who has multiple options or in the individual market, every company has a different application, right? They maybe all ask similar questions, but the application is different. The idea of the marketplace is there's one application that you fill out, okay? It's three pages, it started out as 20 some, it's down to three, and a lot of that is just really kind of descriptive information. As employers, all of you who, do, uh, to, who own a business or work at a business, you are required, if you're subject to the Fair Labor Standards Law, which most of you are, by October 1st to give your employees notice of what the marketplace is going to be. You have to tell your employees that it exists. You have to describe what the marketplace does. You have to state that there may be premium credits available that your employees can use to purchase coverage through the marketplace. And you have to give a general description of the coverage that the employer does off offer. Now many of you as, as business owners, you may, or as employees, you may already get a summary plan description that describes the insurance coverage that, that your company offers or that you offer. This is a little bit different format and it's a little, uh, allows that apples to apples comparison because every employer needs to tell its employees the same thing about what type of coverage that they offer. Uh, the feds have issued this model notice um, that employers can use, and while it is still subject to change, I think they're pretty close to, to what this is gonna look like. What does the marketplace do? The, the idea of the marketplace, it's, it's supposed to serve multiple functions. It provides eligibility. It provides the application. It determines eligibility for subsidies. It verifies whether a person has employer coverage, and it determines affordability. It offers the enrollment function. It offers plan management in that if I go to the marketplace, whether I take my employees and, and offer my employees to the marketplace for insurance purposes, or as an individual, I know that the only type of coverage I can buy is coverage that's gonna satisfy the healthcare reform requirements and the individual mandate. Because all of us as individuals, as long as not, we're not entitled to Medicare, are required to procure individual coverage unless we have certain, we meet certain income requirements or we're eligible for Medicaid. And so when you do go to the marketplace, if you're confused about 2014 and I've got this tax I have to pay if I don't have coverage, you will know that if you go to the marketplace, and that includes the Wisconsin federally facilitated exchange, that you won't be offered coverage that doesn't satisfy your requirement to have coverage. And so that's part of the function of the marketplace. The marketplace provides consumer assistance. This is the navigator program. This is the idea that there is someone or something, it might be an entity, it might be a person, who has knowledge of all the benefit programs offered in the marketplace and can assist you with finding out information about the benefit programs available. They don't pick the program for you, but they are there to offer assistance. And finally, what the marketplace does, it provides financial management. That is collecting, when, when an employer is taking its employees to the marketplace, it's collecting the premiums from the employer, and this starts actually in 2015, collecting the premiums for the, from the employer for all the employees that went to market, and then remitting that to the different carriers and the insurers who are participating in the marketplace. Um, as you've heard, you know, in the news and tonight, Wisconsin is considered a federally facilitated exchange. Uh, Wisconsin is not building its own exchange, unlike Minnesota and some other states. And it's a smaller employer in 2014, and that's basically defined as less than 100 full-time equivalents, is able to shop at the marketplace starting next year. And what happens is the employer takes all of its full-time employees, and that is a defined term under the law, anyone who uh, regularly works or is expected to work 30 or more hours a week. The employer goes to the marketplace and says, employees, here are your options. And generally, th there's four bands of coverage in the marketplace, different metal levels. The employer can pick a level, say it's the 60% level, the bronze level, and take its full-time employees there. The employer doesn't have to contribute towards it if it doesn't want to, but it can. And then the employees, and this is in 2015, 2014 is a little bit scaled back, but in 2015, the employees who have gone to the marketplace through their employer can pick a particular benefit plan within that level. So unlike today, my office, we have basically two options, and if I don't like those, then that, that's too bad for me. 
Um, if my employer would go to the marketplace in 2014 and actually 2015, the employer can pick a level of coverage and then within that level, I can pick a different option. You know, I'll just name some carriers, say Security Health, say Aetna, just, I'm just picking them out of the blue, but I could pick those particular options and even those different carriers might have different, little bit different benefit structures uh, within those options. So the idea of the marketplace is employers can take their employees to the marketplace and then the employees can purchase what they want through the marketplace. The marketplace determines the subsidies and that's all that's behind the scenes at the federal level and the concept there is the feds will ping different databases, IRS, tax returns, all sorts of information that the government has about you and I'm not going to get into any of that kind of stuff tonight. But, but they will ping the various databases and so as an employer I am not finding out what my employees make. I don't know whether my employees are at or below the poverty level. But if I take my employees to the marketplace, the, the federal government will tell me by virtue of telling me how much I owe for that employee, what that's going to be net of any subsidies that are available to the employee. So I'm not getting into employees' tax returns. Um, the employee is getting the subsidi subsidized premium. And as the employer, I will remit then the total premium, which I'm going to take money out of the employee's checks to pay for. That's also part of this. But that's basically the marketplace starting in 2014 and then going on to 2015. Um, from an employer standpoint, here's what I'm seeing. Do I have clients or prospective clients who are saying, help me restructure my company so I don't have to worry about this? Yes. Um, Olive Garden, Darden Restaurants, right off the bat, they were going to just make all their part-time people less than 30 hours a week so that they wouldn't have any full-time people. Um, yeah, there are people that are wasting a lot of time and money doing that for the sole purpose of avoiding the pay or play penalty in 2014. Does it make good business sense? I don't know. I, I really don't know, but there are those who are doing that. Um, there are some limits on restructuring that can, I mean, it, it, you can't just divide your business in half and say, well, I've got 25 employees in each and so we're less than the limit. That's not going to work. But um, there are also a lot of smaller nonprofit clients uh, and, and people who come to my seminars who love this because they have such a small group that they are going to be able to go to the marketplace, not have to worry about underwriting, not have to worry about those annual renewals, and can say to the public as they're hiring, we offer health insurance. And they don't necessarily have to pay anything towards it, but at least they're able to say, to be competitive, we offer health insurance. So in that, with that respect, the marketplace and healthcare reform is doing some good things. And those employers are happy to call me and say, help, you know, help us work through the marketplace. This is something we really want to do. Um, so I, I think, as I said, it, um, it's like Notre Dame football. Either you love it or you hate it. Um, and I think as we start working through healthcare reform, as we get into open enrollment in October, and see the full array of uh, things available to us in the marketplace, I think then the, the truth will be told. But um, for my clients, they are actually now into that beyond the denial stage, maybe a little bit more of the anger, but that's still a bit more constructive, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. David. We, um, I think Eric and uh, Corey both said that we would try to be out by nine, um, and um, so with that, uh, we'll have uh, we'll have uh, maybe 45 plus minutes to have questions. So, prepare those. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. Can everybody hear me in the back? Um, there, there have been three times in my life when I've been riveted by votes in Congress. The the first time. I, w I wasn't even close to being alive. Um, how many of you saw the movie Lincoln? And, and he wasn't even in a lot of the scenes when the House of Representatives voted in, I think it was January of 1865, to pass the 13th Amendment that freed millions of Americans for whom an awful lot of young men from Wisconsin in the Iron Brigade and elsewhere had, had fought in places like Gettysburg. And as the vote got closer in that fictitious scene in the House of Representatives, I, I couldn't take my eyes off the screen. It was just utterly, utterly 
fascinating to see people debating about getting to a majority, that if they could get that majority and the speaker's gavel could come down, human beings would be free. The second time I was riveted was in the summer of 18, 1964, more than uh, almost 100 years later. I was a teenager, and I was watching the reports from Congress. They wouldn't actually televise the debates. It was the, the summer of 1964, and they were voting on the Civil Rights Act. And I remember watching Roger Mudd, a CBS reporter, standing on the steps of the Senate as they tried to get a bipartisan agreement um, between uh, the Democrats and Republicans to end the filibuster and vote to give people basic civil rights, the right to go to a, um, a drinking fountain or sit in a restaurant or ride on a bus, regardless of race or color or creed. And it was just fascinating. I couldn't tear myself from that. The third time was one that um, uh, Eric has already referred to. It was the, the winter of 2010, and the House of Representatives was voting on the Affordable Care Act. And it was a great source of pride for me that David Obey, uh, your congressman for so many years, was standing, as I recall, um, up there on the dais the speaker for the moment, watching the votes come in. And on the TV screen that we could all see, we could see the numbers, the tally coming up. And when it finally hit 218, I think that was the magic number, there was a burst of applause. And uh, Congressman Ogie was only there for a few, few seconds after that. I believe the, the official speaker took over and announced the vote. But I was so proud that at that moment when a majority of the House had enacted national health insurance reform that, that David Obey was there. So I, I just wanted to say that here to all of you and, and to Congressman Obey. It was a great source of, of, of pride and, and gratitude. R regardless of whether you agree with that law or not, to feel that, that we from Wisconsin, those of you from this congressional district, could be part of that incredibly important historical moment, I think is something to remember for a long, long time. Um, I want to talk about what I consider to be the three big decisions that Congress made that night and in implementing this law. There's, the, I don't know how many pages are in the Affordable Care Act. It actually depends on how many, uh, what, what, how many, what the spacing is, triple space or double space, or whether you use 10 point or eight point font. But it's, it's big, it's a thousand pages or more, pretty much any way you count it. But there are three big things that Congress did. The, the first was to expand Medicaid. We think of Medicaid as a program for the poor, but in lots of states, including Wisconsin, large numbers of the poor have always been excluded from Medicaid. And what Congress said was that we're going we're gonna to end that. We're going to make sure that all the poor, if they are um, citizens of the United States and not in prison and don't have a religious objection, if they're poor, they're going to be uh, covered by Medicaid. The second big thing that Congress did was it restructured, I don't want to call it the bottom part, but the, the, the more, in some ways, the more complex and uh, almost tumultuous part of the health insurance marketplace, the individual and small group market. And that's what we're mostly talking about this evening, the health insurance exchanges. And the third big thing that Congress did was it layered over the entire insurance system a series of reforms. Some of them have become law already. So some of you probably have kids or grandkids who got to stay on their parents' health insurance coverage. I know my, my sons have been able to stay on uh, our coverage because of that law. Um, so, so these are the three big things that were done. I want to start off going to the first slide. Make sure I, so I push the right button here. Oops, that's, going, that's the wrong button. OK, here we go. The first thing I want to talk about is the Medicaid expansion and the, particularly the boundary between where Medicaid ends and where the exchange begins. This is what Medicaid or Badger Care, the part for people who aren't, uh, don't have a disability, aren't, aren't seniors, looks like today. It goes way above uh, the poverty line if you're a, a child. Um, it's free up to about 200% of the poverty line. Above that, you pay on a sliding scale. For custodial parents, uh, you uh, get to go up to 150% of the poverty line 
and pay no premium, and then above that, a sliding scale that stops at uh, 200%. But if you're an adult without dependent children, so-called childless adults, although a lot of them do have children, you have hardly any coverage, even in Wisconsin. We have something called the Badger Care Core Plan. It started out around 25,000 people. It's been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So what, what the governor proposed was this. Now, it's been referred to as rejecting Medicaid expansion. But that's not true. That's not an accurate description of what Governor Walker uh, proposed or what the legislature did. He did, in fact, propose, and the Joint Finance Committee has adopted, about a 90,000-person expansion of Medicaid, of the Medicaid entitlement, to adults without dependent children up to 100 percent of the poverty line. It's not the kind of expansion that Congress had in mind, but it is an expansion. It's under Medicaid. The federal government will pay uh, roughly 60 percent of the cost. And that's what that dark red arrow signifies. The governor also proposed that people who are custodial parents above 100 be taken off of Medicaid. So the governor's proposed an expansion and a contraction. But the bottom line is that the governor's proposal fulfills the general uh, notion of, of Congress, which is that Medicaid should cover all the poor. If what the governor has proposed and, and finance has agreed to is approved by the legislature within the next few days, virtually every poor person, officially poor person in Wisconsin for the first time will qualify for Badger Care, for Medicaid. So what's been the fuss about? The fuss is about the difference between this slide and this slide. Now, from the back of the auditorium, you may not be even able to tell the difference. What a number of others have proposed is that the border between where Medicaid ends and the green line, which is eligibility for this health insurance exchange starts, should not be 100 percent, but 133. The debate is not about whether to implement or embrace Obamacare, but how to do it, to go up to 100 or 133. And, and you might think, well, going up to 133 will cost Wisconsin taxpayers more. In fact, because of the formula that Congressman Obie and others voted on covering somewhat more people, drawing that line a little bit higher, would actually result in a reduction compared to the governor's proposal of about $119 million over the biennium, over the two-year budget, and almost half a billion dollars by the year 2021. So instead of general tax revenue rising, general tax spending would decline. You as taxpayers would spend less if we covered more people. But the governor and the members of the Finance Committee didn't want to do that. They wanted this instead. So that's likely to become the law. That, is likely, that slide is likely to be the boundary instead of, uh, instead of this. So we'll have to live with that. And as several of the speakers have said, that's the law. We're going to have to make the best of it, even though it's going to cost uh, taxpayers uh, more money, and even though um, it's going to result, this gets quite technical, in a larger number of private employers with 50 or more full-time equivalent employees being exposed to the risk of having to pay the kind of uh, extra tax that Mary Ellen was talking about. Under the governor's proposal, more people will be paying that tax if they're, if they're somewhat larger employers. Under this alternative, uh, under this alternative rather, fewer people would pay it. But those decisions have now been made, so we have to move forward from here. I want to skip over these slides and show you this. This is the Affordable Care Act. This is the, the mega diagram to show you the whole thing. And, and the reason I want to do this is, is to show you, um, you see those, uh, those ovals that are striped? I don't know if you can read the one that says Medicaid and S-chip. Well, just below that is one that says basically exchange. There's actually two exchanges. One is called the Individual Exchange, formerly the American Health Benefits Exchange. The other is called the Small Employer Health Options Program, or the Shop Exchange. They're both the exchange. Now we don't call them the exchange anymore. We call them the marketplace. So you've got to get the terminology right. It's very confusing. But the reason why this slide is important is that those red striped ovals are very close to each other. That's the border that I was just describing. It's, it, it's not going to be 133, which would cost us less. It'll be 100, 
which will actually cost us more, but that's where we are. But wherever the border is, a lot of people over time are going to be moving back and forth. One thing to understand about this law is that it doesn't just define you as being this kind of person at this point in time and then say, that's it, till the end of time. If you get divorced, if you get married, if you earn more money, if someone else in your family earns more money, you could move from Medicaid eligibility across that Rubicon, across 100% of the poverty line, not longer, no longer be eligible for Medicaid, but instead be eligible for exchange coverage, or you could go the other way. So one of the big challenges we face is managing this constant flow of the situations of low-income people so that they're not falling between the cracks. Those of us that have looked at this law, whether we like the law or don't like the law or partially like the law, I think all of us are worried about the probability that a fairly large number of people will find this confusing, or even if they understand it, their circumstances will change and they will, they'll fall between the cracks. So we, we need to work together to try to reduce that, that, uh, that problem. Let me talk about um, some of the important things to uh, think about as we begin to implement particularly the marketplace exchange part of this complicated scenario. I started off by saying that um, the, the starting point of the marketplace is limited by where Medicaid ends. So, but I also want to emphasize that where we start with the marketplace, uh, up and above Medicaid eligibility, is not limited by Congress. Any limits that are imposed are imposed by the state of Wisconsin. So, for example, right now, in 2014, eligibility for the, individual, for the sm uh, small employer exchange will stop at 50 full-time equivalent employees. But in 2016, it automatically goes up to 100. We could actually choose to expand that even sooner. And then beginning in 2017, if we wanted to, we could open up this exchange all the way up to any limit we wanted. So the exchange is not fixed. It's as big as we want to make it. Um, one of the important questions is, is that a wise decision? Um, a lot of us are waiting to see what the actual bids are and the prices are. Um, California was expected to have higher prices, but the actual premiums, at least according to the California people, are lower than current spending. So there's a lot of discussion and debate about whether that's real. We obviously have a, some, uh, uh, one view that says it's not. We'll see. We'll see what the numbers finally are. L let me just wrap up by talking about a few of the key challenges we face in implementing the exchange. I've, I've, I've mentioned the boundary issue with Medicaid. I've mentioned the question of expanding it to larger groups of employers. But however big it is, here's some important things to consider. A lot of the near poor people in the exchange even though they don't have to pay very much, are going to have to pay something. How do people who aren't banked, who don't have checking or savings accounts or credit cards, actually get the money to the insurance company that they've, uh, that they've chosen? Another issue is um, to what extent uh, should we as a state have higher standards than the minimum federal standards for ranking the quality of the plans? The federal government says a set of minimums but Wisconsin is free to set higher standards or not. So that's an important discussion to have. The issue of enrollment is, let me just finish on that. The exchange is not self-enrolling. Just because it exists, it doesn't mean that people who are eligible for it will just be enrolled. It's not, it's not just a fact. They're going to have to go online to a navigator to some sort of system and provide information and sign up. And sometimes they won't have enough information and sometimes the system will push back. So all of us, whether it's in Wausau or Milwaukee or Madison or anywhere in the state or the country, have a big challenge ahead of us to get people enrolled to be sure that they get the, uh, the coverage that they're entitled to. Uh, thank you for, uh, for listening. Look forward to your questions. I can tell your speakers have um, a great deal of uh, background and wisdom in this uh, area. We um, are grateful, frankly, for their condensing their most uh, important thoughts to 15 minutes, saving us this time then to ask them questions. Are there any questions from the audience that uh, folks would like to ask? 
I have a microphone in the back. Here we are. Yes. So, a microphone coming to you. Thank you. Um, I guess I've read in a lot of media, including the Wall Street Journal last week, that 30 governors out of the 50 states have chosen to have uh, the federal government facilitate the exchanges and not state government. So in that way, isn't Wisconsin, I mean, Wisconsin is not unique. It's actually in the majority because 30 of the 50 states have, have 30 governors have chosen to have the feds facilitate the exchange, exchanges. Panelists, you have a, uh, in fact, you have a little green, a little button on the top of your microphone. If you'll hit that, uh, if you'd like to make a response. Bob, do you want to take a? Okay, there it is. Um, <clears throat> actually, we let 30, some people. We only let some people have a microphone that works. Actually, actually 35 states uh, now. Uh, it actually jumped by two a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we'll have the federal government do the exchange. It largely comes down to, um, not entirely, but Republican states tending not to want to run the exchange. Democratic states wanting to do it. Um, there's also a fear that I, I think is well placed among many, uh, many states, many governors, that we think there are gonna be some significant implementation problems. And I, I don't say that, make that as a political comment. This thing is big and it's complex. And so there's a reticence on the part of some politicians to, to, want to, to want to have their name on it. So largely blue states went ahead and did the exchange. Largely red states did not. My sense is over the years, it'll probably come back to the states wanting to control it. One of the things that surprised all of us is you would think states' rights Republicans would want to control it. And I think ultimately they will. Um, I gave a speech to the Kansas legislature last fall while they were debating this, and I said, at the time, the guy running the exchange program was a former insurance commissioner from Maryland, one of the bluest states. And I just, the speaker was sitting right there and I said, do you want somebody from Maryland coming into Kansas to show you how to run your insurance system? Come on. And, but the bottom line is, for ideological reasons in Kansas, for political reasons, they passed on it. I think it'll change, but we'll see. Others, David? No, I, I, I totally agree with that analysis. Um, I, I, it, I think the direction will be in favor of the states taking over. And, and there, there, there are good reasons for it. Um, some of them have to do with the ability to set higher standards. Um, some of them have to do with adjusting the exchange rules to the special circumstances of, of the market. Um, in many states, there's only one or two insurers, private insurers. Blue Cross, for example, dominates in many of the New England states. We have a very robust and competitive marketplace here. So the, so the federal government, in setting up their rules, they have to deal with kind of you know, the average. They, they're not going to be as sensitive to uh, the particularities of a state that has the kind of market. So I think eventually there will be pressure you know, from people all across the political spectrum to, to take, take it back into our own hands. We'll see. Good. Another question. Yes, here in the middle of the room. In regard to the Medicaid expansion, uh, my understanding from a recent meeting is that Secretary Sebelius really hasn't given us in the state of Wisconsin the waiver yet for that. Is that true and is it possible that that waiver may not go through? Uh, the state hasn't actually applied for the waiver yet. I don't know if they will until the law, the, the budget is signed into law. The people in the department the, the, the bureaucratic level are, are working on developing the waiver request, so I don't think it'll be long after Governor Walker signs the budget that it goes in. The, the real question is, is the one you pose, which is if Wisconsin presents to the federal government, to CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, a request to go up to 100, to expand, but only up to 100, will the feds say, no, we really had 133 in mind, this isn't good enough, uh, or you've got to do that under certain special rules and requirements, and the state says no to that. Or will they say, well, going from zero to 100 is, you know, pr pretty good. It's four-fifths of the way there. Yes, we'll approve that. You realize, state, you're only going to get 60 cents back on the dollar rather than 100 cents on the dollar, but if that's what you want, go ahead. I, I, I think that Secretary Sebelius and her 
her staff will make the latter decision and to prove it, but it is too early to tell. Um, so I think uh, what one thing for people to understand is that if January 1st, 2014 rolls around and the waiver hasn't been approved, then, uh, then that entire group of adults without dependent children uh, gets, uh, gets no coverage. Uh, I th I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, that the current Badger Care core waiver expires at the end of 2013. So we go from covering 10 or 15,000 people by then to covering zero. When, when the waiver is approved, if it's approved, we then go from, go up to 90,000. Right. Um, I'm not sure what, what Sebelius will do, but I think that there are some really big public policy issues here, not just political issues. The Congressional Budget Office did an analysis of putting people in the exchange versus Medicaid. And, and they, uh, and that's the impartial legislative bureau in Washington, D.C. That, that, that really is everybody just trusts the numbers they come up with. You've got, you got to trust somebody when you make these decisions, and so we trust the CBO. But anyway, the CBO said, that to put somebody in Medicaid will cost $6,000 a year on average in the country. That may not be the case in Wisconsin, but that's the average in the country. The CBO said that to put somebody in the exchange will cost the federal government $9,000. So given what the governor has proposed and the legislature's approved, they're gonna be asking, now, they're gonna be asking Sebelius to pay $9,000 for every person they put in the exchange versus the $6,000 that the federal government was willing to pay toward putting somebody in Medicaid. That's, that's the first issue that, that is, is not an insignificant issue. The other issue is that the Medicaid uh, program is designed for people who are poor. It doesn't have deductibles and, and co-pays. Maybe Badger Care has a few dollars here and there. I'm not familiar with your program. But largely, uh, what you pay in deductibles and co-pays doesn't keep you from the doctor. The plan that, that, that somebody making $12,500 a year would get in the exchange would cost them a little bit of premium, maybe two, $300, uh, but it would also have probably a $700 deductible. So you're asking these people to go sign up and pay two, $300 in premium, which is a real bargain, for a plan that, that you know, they're making twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 a year and they gotta pay $700 if they wanna go to the doctor. And that's, that's, so the other problem Sebelius is going to have is Wisconsin wants to put the poorest people in a plan that was not designed for the poorest people. So there are, now, on the other hand, clearly the Obama administration has been bending over backward to try to accommodate the governors to get as much done as they can. So I, I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens here because this is not a political statement, but just from a pure policy statement, a pure policy perspective, this proposal does not make a lot of sense. It doesn't make a lot of sense for the federal government to pay $3,000 more per person to put them in your exchange. And, it, and uh, your legislative bureau, your equivalent of the CBO, in Madison said that you can take these 85,000 people that are on the cusp here, and you can, if you put them in Medicare, the state's gonna be almost $500 million ahead over the next 10 years, 100, was 119 million over two years, um, taking the money. And so I got to tell you, the numbers just don't work. I don't get it. And we'll see what Sebelius does. Marie Ellen, want to take a swing? Well, I think the, from the employer impact that this, this uh, you can't call it a donut hole that's already been used in, in healthcare, but the concept that for an employer, uh, an applicable large employer, an employer with 50 or more full time equivalents who is subject to either providing coverage in 2014 or paying some sort of penalty if either the coverage isn't quite good enough, isn't affordable, or they don't, they don't provide any coverage at all. That penalty doesn't apply to any individual who has either is eligible for Medicare or is on Medicaid or Badger Care. And so that's the whole point of, uh, for uh, any administration to say, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court said we don't have to take the Medicaid expansion and health care reform. You can't force us to do it. That was the only part of, of health care reform that was struck down by the U.S. Supreme Court. That's all great. So now the states could make their decision. Do they want to expand or not? So for those who don't expand Medicaid, that means even though these people might get coverage, as he said, through the exchanges, employers pay penalties for people in exchanges. 
basically. They don't play, pay penalties when their employees are in Medicare or in Medicaid, Badger Care here in Wisconsin. So from an employer standpoint, not only does it not make sense as a taxpayer um, to, you know, the $9,000 versus $6,000 thing, but the concept of if you are going to be an employer and you're saying, I'm not going to provide coverage, what's my bill? Your bill is going to be higher if your lower income people are in an exchange as opposed to in Medicaid. And that, that penalty, everyone, and I didn't get a chance to say this because I was too long-winded, the penalty that employers pay, while it might seem to be, you know, the check you're writing, $2,000 per year, starting in 2014 if you don't provide coverage to a full-time person, that $2,000 isn't deductible. And so when you go to your CFO and say, hey, I'm going to save us money, we can drop health insurance and pay penalties for our employees, that's not deductible. And there's one thing that, that for-profit entities don't like, it's an expense that you can't deduct. So, um, <laughs> so it's not just, you know, oh, it's, it's equal, let's go with the penalty. Um, the the non-deductible nature of it, I think, is, is a big deal. Another question. While we're going at this question, let me just ask, you know, so, so the panelists have said tonight um, that there's a $2,000 penalty for those folks who, that are in groups over 50 or so. And, and the cost of individual care be 5,000 plus. Even deductibility uh, aside, there's probably an unevenness to that. Why wouldn't we just have everybody, well, why wouldn't employers over the, over the uh, size of 50 employees just bring everybody into the exchange? And, and I'm sorry, why wouldn't, they, why wouldn't they pay the penalty, right? And then, and then forward folks into that experience. Um, in my, you know, as I kind of said it before, we, we like to be the employer of choice and um, employer provided health coverage for both the working, uh, working folks and retirees, especially in Wisconsin, is a very strong tradition. And um, my, my story is open enrollment is hard enough um, within our workforce with just two options to pick from, to have um, true open enrollment and just say, here, everyone have a raise, go out to the exchanges and buy coverage. Um, there's, I think that would be a lot, very disruptive. And mm -hmm. that's just because in, in, in a lot of professional workforces, um, public sector, we are used to having employer provided coverage. It might be cheaper, but we all have to think about the individual decisions that all of us would have to make then. And, that, and there are people making these decisions every day and I don't mean to belittle that, but um, a lot of us are used to being taken care of uh, from, with our employers. We get paid, we have a retirement program, we have health coverage, and to just put everybody in the market could be rather disruptive and that, that detracts from people you know, helping helping people like this, so that, that, that's just a practical reason. It, it might be cheaper, but it's not worth the hassle. As I go around the country, you hear that a lot. Pay the $2,000 fine, send them to the exchange. It, it actually doesn't work that simply. Let's say that it, the employer is paying $7,000 toward the average employee's health insurance package, the, the average of family and single. All right, so, so they can now say that. So let's, let's give them the $7,000, send them to the exchange. Actually, you can't because first of all, you got the $2,000 fine. So you've got the $7,000, take the $2,000 fine away. Actually, you probably should take $3,000 away because it's not tax deductible. Let's take $2,000 away from the $7,000, okay? All right, so now you got $5,000 left. Give it to them, go to the exchange. But if you run a business, it doesn't work that way. If you give somebody $5,000 a salary, you've got payroll costs, Social Security, Medicare, uh, group life insurance, disability, vacation time, unemployment insurance, that $5,000 very quickly becomes $4,000. Okay, so now you give them $4,000 and they go to the exchange. Well, that, that money is, ta is not tax deductible for them. They're going to have to pay tax on that. The insurance they buy in the exchange is not a deduction. So they're going to have to pay tax on the $4,000. So now maybe it's $3,000 that they're taking to the exchange. Okay, now they go to the exchange. The exchange subsidies I showed you are based on family income. And this is the one that really, that by now, when you're talking to the business owner, their, their head's starting to spin. Because this employee over here uh, makes uh, $55,000 working for me, and he's going to get uh, uh, the following subsidy. But this employee over here makes $55,000, but he's got a spouse making $55,000. They're making $110,000. They get no subsidy. They're going to have to pay, so this $55,000 worker is going to have to pay $15,000 for insurance. They get no subsidy. 
This one over here is going to pay uh, $5,000. They're going to win big. This guy's going to lose big. Now, when, it's, when you're talking about the low-paid workers, the low-paid worker in that scheme is going to really succeed. They're going to be able to go to the exchange. Their insurance is going to be covered. The high-paid worker is, is, going, is the one that's going to suffer. Who's the most valuable employee you have? The guy that's sh sweeping the floor or the engineer making 100000 You're making a hero out, out, out of yourself with the engineer, and you're making the, the guy sweeping the floor, and the engineer's mad, and he's going to go across the street. So when you get through the whole scenario, this business about they're going to pay the fine and drop their insurance is not going to happen. Now, in the under 50 uh, employer market, it's already happening. We only have about 50% of small employers providing health insurance. Why? Because small employers can't afford it. Uh, yeah, if you're a doctor's office, you can afford it. If you're starting a new marketing company, you may not be able to afford it. So I think you're going to see much, much more erosion in the under 50 market, which you've already had anyway. It was going on for years. But where an employer is, com is competing for labor, it's not going to happen. In professional organizations, if, if the doctor partnership, the architect partnership, the law partnership, if they drop the health plan, they no longer have deductible health insurance. That's how they get deductible. They're not going to drop it. So I think it's, it's going to be a very marginal sort of thing. The headline just doesn't pan out when you go through the details. David, anything there? Leave it be, he says. All right, another question. Great. Sorry, I interrupted. Will this act have any effect on the current Medicare program? Will this have an effect on the current, on the current Medicare. Medicare program? Um, I guess is, is really your question, if, if, if you're on Medicare now or about to go on Medicare, should you be worried about what Obamacare is going to do to Medicare? Is that, is that, is that the question? Okay. The short answer is, is no. There's a, there's a longer answer that gets a lot more complicated than that. A lot of money got transferred out of Medicare to help pay for this. The money that got transferred out of Medicare is going to create some real problems with Medicare going forward. It will. There was an, uh, uh, the Medicare trustee report came out a couple of weeks ago and said the Medicare uh, uh, life expectancy actually increased by two years. And then, the, and then the Medicare actuary came out with a separate letter and said, well, the trustees followed the law in saying that, but that assumes the sustainable growth rate cuts continue to happen and the sequester continues to happen and, and, and a whole bunch of technical stuff that you didn't you don't understand what I'm talking about, but big cuts that are unsustainable will happen to doctors and hospitals, and we've got to fix those. So there are fundamental problems with Medicare. Uh, there are Medicare is going to have to be fixed. Medicare starts to get into real trouble in 10 years, but Medicare was going to be in real trouble in 10 years anyway. And there is a chunk of money that came out of Medicare to pay for the Affordable Care Act. But it's interesting that when Paul, every time Paul Ryan's done the Republican budget, he leaves those cuts in there, okay? So, you know, you, you can blame the Affordable Care Act for taking money out. The Republicans make a campaign issue out of it, and the fact is they leave the cuts in there whenever they try to balance the budget. So we have serious problems with Medicare. My sense is that anybody who's on Medicare today or will be going on Medicare in the next two or three or four years, I don't think you've, I would not stay awake at night worrying about the solvency of the Medicare program or whether it's going to be there much as it has been. Medicare goes through changes every year. There are lots of changes going on in Medicare. But the face of Medicare, I think, for the people on it now, is, is going to be pretty much okay. And, and, and I read the trustees' report and I read the actuaries' reports, okay? I think the people who have to worry are the people that are a few years from retirement and, and, the, the, our, the, and the next generation, people who are in their, in their uh, 50s, 40s, and certainly younger people. We're going to have to restructure this program significantly uh, be, uh, or, or it's not going to be there for them. Medicare starts to run into funding problems in about 10 years, and it just starts getting worse at about the 20-year point. Just, can I just add two, two quick things? One is that the, the Affordable Care Act already eliminated the, the donut hole in Medicare Part D. So uh, that was, there was a lot of talk about that when Medicare Part D was first rolled out. It was um, one of the relatively less controversial parts of, of the ACA. Everything was controversial, but that went into law, and I think it's already been, been implemented. So that's already happened. Seniors are not paying that, uh, that deductible in the middle. The, the other thing I just wanted to say was that 
as I've talked to seniors, um, a, a lot of the concerns about the ACA have less to do with themselves, but they have to do with their children or their grandchildren. Uh, you know, seniors are not selfish people, certainly not any more selfish than all the rest of us, uh, or they're, they're often very concerned about their children and how their children are doing, and they recognize that the American economy now is tougher, especially for their grandchildren, than, than it is for, uh, for, for themselves uh, coming into the, you know, the post-World War II era or the baby boom. So I think a lot of them are, are appreciative of the fact that some of their kids, some of their grandkids or nieces or nephews now will not be stuck without health insurance. I, I don't think seniors like looking at a you know, 25-year-old uh, son who's you know, gone to college and is trying to find work and doesn't have insurance or you know, someone who's just had a child and is, isn't covered. They, they, they want family members to be secure, partly you know, there's a selfish motive there. They don't want to have to pay for the, the care, but the main motive isn't selfish at all. They love their kids. They love their grandkids. They want to see them not worrying about going to the hospital, getting that lump looked at, getting that shot for their kids. So I think a, a lot of the benefit for seniors of the Affordable Care Act is not what it does for them at all. It's what it does for their kids, their grandkids, their nieces, and their nephews. Thank you. I have a question of uh, Mr. Reimer. You referenced uh, the situation in California where they opened their bids uh, from the insurance companies, and they were like, if I recall the article I read, I think it was like they were half what they expected, what the experts had predicted they would be. I think there were three states out there that uh, developed their own exchanges, California being one, I'm not sure what the other two were. And they had a similar experience in all those states when the insurance companies sent in their uh, response to their request for bids. Could you comment on that? Is this, is this I mean, at first blush, it looks like a wow moment, but uh, I'm, there's probably something underneath the table here that we don't know. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I, I have looked at this a little bit, and, uh, and, and Robert, you know, sounds like from his nods before has a different take on it, but at least the official presentation from the California Exchange <clears throat> was when, when they laid out region by region in California what their bids were uh, they highlighted a bid, I think, particularly for a 40-year-old single person looking at bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. There were a few regions where they said it was a little bit um, more expensive than the 2013, but in most of the regions, the, 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 the bids they were getting were, were lower. Um, maybe that's the wrong way to look at it. They have a self-interest in saying that they produced this result. Um, if it's valid, is it valid on an ongoing basis, or was it a one-year wonder? What were the reasons for it? Um, I think there are a lot of unanswered questions. The, 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 the news stories that I saw were the same ones you saw, where an, an, any number of people you know, who, who basically didn't think it was going to happen, thought the bids were going to be a lot higher, said in public, I, I was wrong. But I, I, I guess I'm cautious about it. I, I would like to dig more deeply into the data perhaps you know, Robert and uh, uh, Mary Ellen and others have. Um, let me say this. I think at the end of the day, if you had the exchange big enough so that it wasn't subject to adverse selection, meaning a lot of you know, sicker people getting into it and healthier people not, if it were big enough and if the incentives were quite clear that you make a lot of money, insurance plans, if you bid low and you make less money, you get fewer customers and less revenue, and less profit if you bid high. I believe that a combination of those forces would constrain cost growth. Whether we can get to that with the, the size of the exchange being what it is, is, is the question in my mind. So let me end here and probably turn it over to my fellow panelists for perhaps a very different point of view. You, you know he's, he's getting ready. His, I'm going to unload on him. You can just sense him, can't you? <laughs> Wait, I, yeah, I, I know a little bit about the California exchange. Um, I'm, I'm not, this, I'm just sort of channeling what, what pundits and experts have said. I yeah. don't know very much about it. Um, California exchange announced that their insurance rates had not gone up. There hadn't been rot, rate shock and, and everything was fine. Um, Day or two after that, the Los Angeles Times had an editorial lauding the California Exchange for doing a great job. Three days after that, Chad Tahoon, one of their staff writers in the Los Angeles Times, wrote an article 
where he looked at the same policies you could buy at eSurance.com, which is a website you can go buy insurance on today in Wisconsin or anywhere else. And then he looked at the price in the exchange, and he generally found a 60% difference. Um, Ohio, a few days later, announced their exchange rates. Ohio is John Kasich's state, a Republican-run state. The Republican lieutenant governor came out, and she announced the results of the rates in Ohio. And what do you think she announced? Well, she announced 80% differences, and in Obamacare is a terrible thing. I was quoted in the Washington Post the next day saying, well, we got a Democratic state <laughs> saying this and a Republican state saying that, so the truth is probably somewhere in the middle, and it, and it probably is. Um, there'll be an article in the Wall Street Journal either tomorrow or Monday, I don't know exactly when, that I've been working on with the, with the Wall Street Journal, on Virginia's rates. Virginia will be announcing its rates. Virginia's a state very much like Wisconsin in terms of its rating structure and, and regulation. And I did a lot of analysis on that last night, looking at the rates. Same insurance company, same product, now upgraded for Obamacare. You're looking at 40, 50, 60 percent increases. Now, there are a number of reasons for that. One is we get rid of pre-existing conditions in medical underwriting. People are saying, well, it's apples and oranges. You've got an individual market now where everybody has to go through underwriting. Uh, you've got a market over here where people don't have to go through underwriting. You've got a market over here where you can buy a Chevrolet. You've got a market over here in Obamacare now where you've got to buy a Cadillac, and I'm being general here. There are, there are a whole series of issues here. But the fact is that what the Affordable Care Act does is it dramatically changes the insurance market and it makes it more expensive. Uh, in California, Blue Shield of California, uh, run by an old friend of mine, uh, announced health insurance rates only 13% higher from this year to next year. So Blue Shield said our rates are only going up 13%. What Paul didn't mention in the press conference is he's taken his provider network from 65,000 doctors in California to 13,000 doctors in California, and he's largely providing the Medicaid network in his exchange product. So there are apples and oranges like crazy in this. The bottom line is we've got, we've got reforms that are going to drive the rates up. I would submit we didn't have to do a lot of this stuff. Uh, one of the problems with Obamacare and insurance underwriting is the individual mandate. I doubt there are many people out there who like the individual mandate. You know who hates the individual mandate more than anybody I've met? The insurance companies. Because they don't think it's going to be effective the way it's designed. As a result, they put a lot of fudge into their rates because they think only the sick people are going to show up. That's one of the things driving it. Another thing driving it are the benefit mandates. Um, I wish Obamacare had grandfathered people's current coverage. The president said if you like your coverage, you can keep it. If he had done that, most of this rate shock would go away because people could keep what they've got. They could always buy a Cadillac. There's nothing against the law of buying a Cadillac health insurance plan. They chose not to. Now they're being forced to upgrade. Age rating. Uh, we, there's something called uh, age rating where an older person can't be pay, pay more than three times a younger person, which for many of the people in this crowd would be popular, I'm sure. But what it does is it makes a 25-year-old's health insurance double what it is today. The insurance industry and a number of insurance regulators beg the Obama administration to phase that in over three years. In Massachusetts, where we have Romney Care, uh, which is a law very much like the, the Affordable Care Act, uh, it turns out Massachusetts has six rating factors that are going to turn out to be illegal. Everybody says Massachusetts is the same thing as Obamacare. They actually have six factors that are going to be different and, and uh, the state would have to change them on January 1, and it would create some rate shock in the small group market. The Obama administration granted a waiver for Massachusetts to phase that in over three years. Why didn't they phase the rating adjustments for age in over three years? So yes, rates are going to jump considerably, and yes, it's apples to oranges. Uh, but, it's, but, it's, but it is apples to oranges, and the rates are going to be higher. And I think a lot of people are going to get letters from their insurance companies this fall that are going to surprise them. Excellent. I'm going to time check us at about 19 minutes left. How many questions do I have out there? Do I force our panelists into a lightning round? Okay. Yes. Here. Microphone coming your way. Uh, if you were... If you were betting people, and uh, you, you may not be, let me change that. What are the chances that the 
federally facilitated marketplace is going to be in place in Wisconsin by October 1st. I think it will be. Um, uh, let, let, let me ask one more question, David, so that are there any indicators that we can watch for that would tell us whether that's a realistic date or whether it's going to be a push? Sure. The, 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 um, you know, they're, they're going to start to be um, announcements from CMS. There'll be, you know, TV and radio stories based on press releases. The, the, the question is not whether it'll be available. The question is whether it'll be super clunky, somewhat clunky, a little clunky, or perfect. It's going to be, I think, a lot closer to super clunky. It, there's going to be all kinds of bugs in it, some of which are due to, you know, just ignorance. I mean, how many of us, when we do a big thing the first time, get it right? We often, you know, often takes a while. Um, some, some of it will be, uh, I mean, I think one concern, frankly, that exists, not, not just in Wisconsin, but, but a lot of the states that have federally facilitated exchanges have leaders who are against Obamacare. So what kind of messages are they going to be giving to their Department of Health Services, insurance commissioners, and others? Are they going to say, really cooperate with these federal people to implement a law I hate? Or are they going to say, you know, obey the law, do the right thing, but don't go overboard. My priorities lie elsewhere. So as that message filters down through the bureaucracy, I, I fear that there's going to be not so much active non-cooperation, but a certain amount of passive resistance and, OK, I'll get back to you, federal official, but how about next week? So you know, there's going to be a lot of that gumminess, gunkiness in the, in the works. But eventually, a lot of it will get worked out. It'll get better. Some of you may remember that when Medicare Part D rolled out, there were all kinds of stories. What a disaster it was, how terrible this was, and it's not working, and what a crisis. Well, when was the last time there was any story about Medicare Part D having a problem, except maybe in the technical press? I mean, I, I haven't seen one in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel in years. So, you know, grown-ups working hard at this will get a lot of it right over time. So I think that both the naysayers, it's a total disaster, it's a train wreck, it's going to fail, are wrong. I think that some of the federal officials that are saying it's going to be just fine, don't worry, a few little kinks, but you know, nothing much to, to think about, are, are wrong too. It'll get better over time, even when it's quote unquote perfectly fixed, it's still going to require, what, what do they say, continuous process improvement to get better and better. Um, Thank you. I get an email every week from the Maryland Exchange. Maryland is one of the states that is implementing their own exchange, and they give me a progress report on where they are, all the data point, all the points in getting their systems up and running, and uh, it's just really impressive. Maryland is going to be in great shape. I'm sure they'll have a few problems, but Maryland is is doing just terrific. There are a number of other states that are doing well, um, five or six that that I'm sure are doing well. Then you get to the federal exchange. I got a call from a reporter a couple of weeks ago. He says, have you seen the federal data hub? The federal data hub is the core of the federal exchange. It's the, it talks to Homeland Security to make sure you're a citizen. It talks to the IRS to uh, uh, impose the penalty. It talks to the Department of the Treasury to get the money for the subsidies. Uh, it, it reaches into all the different federal departments. The federal data hub is absolutely crucial to this. He says, have you seen the federal data hub? I said, no, I haven't seen the federal data hub. He said, I'm calling around everywhere. It's mythical. Everybody talks about it. Nobody's seen it. And, and you know, David Petraeus couldn't have an affair, and, and, and they figured it out. Um, the, the, last, the Washington Post is abuzz with all this business about everybody listening to your phone calls or whatever they're doing. They couldn't get away with it. But Sibelius has got the best top secret operation in Washington, D.C. <laughs> nobody has, I'm telling you, nobody has any idea what's going on. Okay? There are no reports. We're getting no information. We have no idea. Sibelius and her team say they're going to be ready. Now, from what I know from the insurance companies, because they have to be part of this, obviously, um, on October 1, you're going to go to the exchange and you're going to see all the insurance plans there. That part of it is finished. All of the companies have submitted their data, and, and they're, they're about ready to go live with that now. But that's not going to be the problem. The problem is that all the insurance companies have to do what we call billing and eligibility interface. Because um, this guy's going to get $1,000 of support, that guy's going to get 1500 
That guy's going to get 5,000. This guy's building the, buying the gold plan. That guy's building the bronze plan. Can you imagine the administrative complexity for the insurance company and the federal government talking to each other here? The federal government has not yet given a single insurance company the uh, information technology specifications to even develop the system to do that. At a meeting about a month ago, one of the government guys got up and told a meeting of insurance industry executives, there's a quirk in the law that says that if somebody doesn't pay your premium, you can't kick them off the plan for three months. So this guy, just, just think of that for a second. Okay, so, so the guy from the government says to the insurance industry, these people are all coming on January 1. Even, we'll give you the names. Since you can't even kick them off till April 1, we don't have to have the eligibility thing really straightened out. So, I don't know, you know, it's, it's, October 1 isn't the challenge. January 2nd, when you go into your doctor's office and he needs to know who you are, that's, that's going to be the challenge. I don't know if they're going to make it or not. I've, I've never seen a top secret operation like this before. We have, we have no idea. But I can tell you that there are a lot of very, very, very nervous insurance executives. I talked to one the other day, he says, I think they're going to give us reams of paper. And I'm going to have hundreds of thousands of names I'm going to have to reconcile. reconcile. I'm not sure how I'm going to figure that out. And then he said, you know what? When this is all screwed up, they're going to blame me. So we'll see what happens. So basically, it'll be fine. You know. <laughs> another, another question. <clears throat> My clients are going to be ready. I don't know what you're all worried about. My clients are all ready. <laughs> yeah, Mary Ellen, Mary Ellen's got them all. Oh, uh, them all. We have 12 minutes left. Another well, question, question I see here? to the panel. Um, what I wanted to know is, uh, what's your understanding of how reimbursements will be at the primary care office, the, the doctor's office? How will they be reimbursed? Will the, I mean, my understanding of Medicare now is about 40 cents on the dollar, and medical assistance is 15 cents on the dollar. Will it go up, will it go down? What's your understanding? Under the exchange? How the doctor gets under the insurance exchange. Under the insurance exchange. Yeah, that's, that's a private insurance plan. So whatever the insurance company negotiates with the doctor, it's a private market situation. Um, in California, Blue Shield has apparently gotten 30% discounts. They've gotten a Medicaid-style uh, fee schedule. Other insurance companies are going with their regular mainstream private insurance reimbursement schedule. It will, de it will depend upon the relationship between the doctor and the insurance company on that. It's not an inconsequential question here um, in the great north, the preponderance or the, the proportion of individuals who are over the age of 65 and, and those who are on Medicaid at the moment um, are greater than in other places in the state as you go from here north. And uh, I think that, that question actually turns out to be pretty important for systems. I don't know if there are any systems folks in the room that, you know, the provider systems that would want to speak to that whatsoever. but. Um, it's not an unimportant question because there, um, I know we're at a point where um, if reimbursements in those two categories, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, fall, there's, we have to make some decisions in budgeting about what services remain. Um, other questions in the crowd? Yes, right here we have, in the back? Yeah, sorry. Well, I have a question um, regarding someone who's between the 150 poverty level and the 200 poverty level who's barely making their utilities and rent hmm. and student loans, what happens to them when they can't pay this? What happens when they don't pay their insurance premium? Right, they can't. Or, or when they the, can't, right? They well, they, yeah, they can't, so they don't. Uh, well, their, their insurance is canceled. According to the rules, you, can, um, you can't kick them off the plan for 90 days, but you can stop paying their claims after the first 30 days of non-payment. So and how long do they wait? How long do they wait once they're off? So after uh, after a period, then there's a blackout of how many months? I think they can probably come back on. I, I don't they think there's a prohibition there. as long as they can pay the premium. There, there there are three problems for this group of people between 100 and 200. What one is an affordability problem. You know, they they just don't have the money, no matter how you measure it, how you look at cash flow. A, a second problem is is to some extent a cash flow problem. A, a fair number of low-income people, particularly if they have, if they have children will, when they file their income tax return, get a substantial income tax refund through the earned income tax credit, which is supplemented in Wisconsin with a, a supplemental credit. There's a child tax credit. There's the homestead credit. So th they'll have a problem between January and December 
putting in that money. Then they get this big lump sum after they file in March and they get it in April or May. But th there's, a, there's a disconnect. And then, of course, when that big lump sum comes in, there are a lot of great things to use it for, to, you know, to pay off student debt, to buy a car, to, uh, you know, fix, to buy a new refrigerator because the one you have isn't working. So it'll go pretty fast. But, you know, if, if people could manage to plan it right, they could probably set aside a couple hundred bucks from it to pay the amount that they didn't think they had in the prior 12 months. So there's a, there's a cash flow issue. The, the, the third issue has to do with a getting the money to the system issue. Um, the, uh, l l let's assume that people have trouble coming up with the money, but, but they can. But the, the, you, know, you, you, you go to the grocery store, you don't get the food unless you hand them the money. You don't get to stay in your home unless you pay the landlord the rent. At a certain point, he or she is going to come kick you out. If you don't pay the electric company, especially after the moratorium comes off, they shut it off. So there's this immediate pressure to take your resources and get these things you need for survival. On the other hand, um, especially if people are in fairly good health, the, the, the incentive to take that 20 or 30 bucks a month, even if it's leveraging a massive premium credit, and, and get it somehow, since you, you, can't, you, know, you can't just put cash in an envelope and mail it to the insurance company, so you've got to find a friend to write the check, or set up a checking account, which may be hard for you to do, or you can go to the check cashing place, but then they'll charge you 50 cents you know, on the dollar. Um, so there's all these, all these kind of practical impediments. And so one of my concerns is that a lot of people, even those that have the money, are going to just, just kind of give up. They're going to say, this is crazy. I could use this money for food. I could use it for toys for the kids. I could use it to you know, get a better stove. Um, instead, I'm spending this money, and I have to go out of my way every month to go to someplace special to give them their money, and what am I getting in turn for it? Well, this thing called insurance, this piece of paper, this promise. Well, I can't eat that promise, but I could eat the, you know, the, the chicken that I could buy w with it instead. So I, I think you're going to see a lot of people giving up on it unless we can come up with, with clever ways to help them meet their obligation, which l literally is an obligation. It is a mandate. The court upheld that. They, they have to get insurance somehow, um, and if they aren't covered by Medicaid, Medicare, or a private employer, then buying coverage in this manner is the way to do it. One of the reasons I ask this question is because I work with um, that, that income level of people, teaching them how to budget and teaching them how to get back on their feet. And I see this as a big setback. I don't know how they're going to possibly come out from where they are and get above, and it's, it's scary. When I look at it, it's scary, because right now with the economy, there's so many people that are barely making it by with eating and utilities and rent, and I have no idea how they're gonna stick another three or $400 in a month. There's just absolutely, I have no idea. And that's one of the things causing the rate shock, because the insurance industry looks at exactly the same scenario. Now, who's gonna sign up, the sick people or the healthy people? Right. The sick people are gonna sign up because they can make money on this deal. They're, and that's, they're, they're smart. The healthy people are going to say $500 a month for a plan with a $2,000 deductible, and I can sign up when I get sick. And, then, and so you wonder why the insurance companies jack up the rates so high? Well, that's why, because they're yeah. scared to death of what's going to happen here. There, there's a, just a, a further comment on this. I mean, there, there's a reason why we have programs like Social Security and Medicare financed by automatic withholding. Um, if, we, if we shifted it and said, you can have the same Social Security and the same Medicare, but you have to go and make the, the, the payment, you know, the 7.65%, even if the employer share was then leveraged by your payment, but if you had to go out of your way and write a check every month out of your paycheck for 7.65, we wouldn't have Social Security, we wouldn't have Medicare, it wouldn't exist. Um, Interestingly enough, I, I read an account in California where precisely because there's a growing anxiety about the, the quality of private pensions, there, there's, there, they have a law out there, I guess, that it's, it's called automatic enrollment, where a certain percent of people's earnings is withheld automatically unless they opt out. And, and even shifting it, even keeping it technically legally voluntary, 
but shifting it from a presumption of you must pay in to a presumption of it will be paid in for you unless you say no, it makes a big difference. And just think about yourself. A lot of us, when we get into the habit of doing something every week, every month, even if we have the right to change it, we tend to keep it going. You know, we tend to keep the newspaper coming. We tend to keep our cable TV on. Even if we sort of think we might change it, unless there's some big reason to change, what we were doing last week continues to be what we're doing next week. So, um, but the, the system, the Affordable Care Act, was not set up with either mandatory withholding to finance this or this so-called automatic enrollment, this what lawyers would call a rebuttable presumption that you will pay in unless you choose to opt out. It requires an affirmative act every week. And I, I think that for all of the people you're talking about, the group I'm most worried about is frankly that, that group between 100 and 133, that when this law was passed, no one ever imagined in designing this law that they would actually have to, to make payments. That wasn't what Congress intended. It was only the, one of the unintended byproducts of the Supreme Court's decision that has put the pressure on that group, uh, the, the nearest poor of the near poor, to have to shell out this money month after month. The, the, I think the physicians join that concern, by the way, that um, how is it the patients will actually receive the, um, the, the benefits that uh, they may be eligible for, but for which the hoops to jump through may be too complicated to actually um, achieve that uh, uh, opportunity to be insured and to add to Bob's comments around complexity. We, we said some things about navigators, but there are these magic navigators that will know everything about the system and make sure that um, each patient has what they need and, and those rules just aren't uh, frankly completely available right now preparing for October 1. Um, we have only moments left. One last burning question. If I hold our, um, if I hold our panel uh, in red back here. Actually, wait for the, uh, just wait for the uh, microphone here, and so we want to be sure and hear your question. Sure, sure. Given what we've heard tonight, it's pretty clear there's going to be significant uh, upfront costs and upfront problems in implementation of this program. Um, how will sequester and other sorts of uh, changes in the federal budget uh, affect the implementation of this going forward? We want to take a swing for that. Congressman, I hope you should answer, answer that. The, the impact of the sequester on, on the implementation. We, we should probably ask uh, Congressman <laughs> Obi to answer this, but uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't think that either the, the fiscal cliff kinds of negotiations or the sequester will, will have a big effect on it. Um, most of the costs are, 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 are entitlements. The Medicaid provision is an entitlement, so it's not subject to uh, appropriation. The tax provisions are, in effect, entitlements. So um, Congress would, would, have to, would have to make an affirmative decision to change the law. Um, the, 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 as I understand it, those things are kind of outside of the scope of, of the sequester language. That doesn't mean they couldn't change it. Um, I, I mean, I think, I think the bottom line is that we've got federal government that's under a lot of fiscal pressure. Um, on the other hand, we have a president who's committed to this law, wants it to go forward, and the fiscal situation is improving somewhat at the federal level. So how all those things play out, I, I think it's just too early to tell. I think, I think we're going to have to wait to see how the 2014 congressional elections come out, um, particularly in the United States Senate, where an awful lot of incumbent senators, especially Democrats from more conservative or moderate states are, are giving up their seats, that, that could be a decisive factor. Um, I, I hate to answer so many questions, but it's too early to tell, but I, I do think that's the right answer here. Well, as you can tell, our, uh, our panelists are uh, knowledgeable and yet uh, are not, um, are not uh, prescient for what is it yet unanswered, right? And we have this amount of uh, language in front of us in a thousand pages um, seeking to provide ever better uh, care for, for uh, we American citizens. The law of the land has to be in one way or another um, met in its intent. I hope that all community members will continue to 
educate ourselves about how it is that we'll take care of, um, take care of us as a community. Um, I thank you for your attendance tonight uh, to WIPS for the, the strong work. Uh, Corey, any other announcements that we would bring to the group tomorrow? Oh yes, and Kate Doring, who's the formal name of her um, organization is is Enroll America. We'll have a um, uh, we'll uh, essentially do, deal with many of the navigation sorts of issues, uh, and have a um, and have a table I at tomorrow's event. So she'd be available if uh, those of you who are attending tomorrow want to have a conversation about uh, the navigators. Corey, any other comments or announcements? Congressman, thank you very much for being here. Panelists, thank you so much for being here. Please join me in thanking them.